you remember in 3.2 we did uh, force we used force equilibrium here in 3.5 we will derive the continuum equilibrium equations for stress which is not exactly the same thing but the use of force equilibrium will be the same as in 3.2 so this is partly a repetition now what is new in this section is that we will evaluate the stress not only in the center point of the cube but also on the right end a on the left end b on the bottom d and on the top c i will refer to the sides of the cube to the faces with letters a b c d all the time when i talk about the center i will refer to as point p okay the coordinates of all those points are given here down Point P is in the center of the cube at position X1, X2. Point A is at the right end of the cube where we go delta L1 half to the right. Delta L1 is the side length of the cube. From the center to point A, it's half delta L1. From the center to point C, it's half delta L2. Okay, so this is the definition of the points. Now, you also remember that we have three, dim three dimensions, three directions. The third direction is not given here. This is already a full sketch. So adding the third direction would not add anything and would only confuse things and hide things from the other. So we are only, I'm only using two directions in the graphics, but we need the third direction. The stress cube has side lengths delta L1, it has side lengths delta L2, and it has side lengths delta L3 out of the plane. We will need delta L3 also. Okay, so that's the definition of this reduced cube. It's the definition of all the points, P, A, B, C, D. It's the definition of the size of the length of the cube. And it's the definition of the stresses on the right end, the stress sigma 1, 1 on the left end, the stress sigma 1, 2 on the right end, shear stress, and the stress sigma 1, 2 on the left. And this is what we did not do before. Before we were only giving one stress on one side, one normal stress and two shear stresses on one side, we were ignoring the other side, the other face. Okay, now here we need both stresses. And why do we do that? Because stress is a field, it depends on position. So the stress can be different at any point. At every any point, it can be different from any other point. So the stress at point P will be slightly different from the stress at point A, will be slightly different from the stress at point B or C or D. Okay, so this field nature we are using now. This is the first time that we are really using it. Now, the sketch which I gave you for the Taylor series was using function Y, variable X. Now, here we will be using function stress sigma variable x1, x2, and x3 in general. So the Taylor series can be done in one direction. It can be in the other direction, two direction, or it can be done in the three direction. And that this is what we need. So the Taylor series in one dimensional mathematics is what I showed you in my sketch. The Taylor series in three dimensional fields, three dimensional space, is that what you, you will need on the next slide. So this is where the Taylor series comes in. The x1, x becomes x1, and delta x, which I was using before, becomes here, due to choice of the side length, it becomes delta L1 half. So this is the delta x, x plus delta x in the sketch, x1 plus 1 half delta L1 in the slides. This is going to the right, x1 minus half delta L1 is going to the left. This is going to the top, this is going to the bottom. Okay, so, and if you stick to one direction, then the Taylor series is still well-defined. If you stick to one direction at a time, nothing is new as compared to the sketch, which I showed you. Okay, and now the final thing is the forces. Uh, on Earth, we have gravity, for example. Gravity is making a volume, a so-called volume force or body force or force per unit volume. If you have a cube of material, the gravity will the gravity will be mass times gravitational acceleration divided by the volume of the cube gives you this F, F2. 
So F2 due to gravity will point downwards. F1 due to gravity will be zero. But there can be other body forces, so that's why in general we use all directions body forces in gravity will always be vertical. In outer space, the body forces will be zero in the space station, for example, when you are in free flight. OK, now, finally, after all these definitions, many, many definitions, which you, if you remember them and if you know how to read the graphics, I would not have had to do this in that much detail. I just wanted to repeat so many things. Now, after all these many definitions, we can write down the force equilibrium for this cube. <clears throat> and we begin in the one direction, as usual. So force equilibrium in the one direction requires that we understand what is the force on the A, on the right-hand side? What is the force on the left? What is the force on the top, which is pointing into the direction? And what is the force on the bottom, which is pointing into the one direction? Okay, so from the line here, you can already see what is ha happening. Sigma 1, 1, A, multiplied with delta L2 times delta L3. What is that? That is the, the surface on the right-hand side. So sigma 1, 1, A multiplied with the surface is force on the right-hand side pointing in one direction. Sigma 1, 1, B multiplied with the area is the force acting on the left-hand side pointing in the negative direction. And this is why we have where we are using a minus here, because it's pointing in the negative direction. Okay, so this difference here is giving us the difference between forces, left and right. If those forces are not equal, then the body is not in equilibrium and it will start to move in general. Okay, and we have translated the forces into stresses. So the stress difference multiplied with the area gives you the force difference, normal force difference. Okay, now in the one direction, and this is why we are not finished yet, in the one direction we are finished. In the in the vertical upper and lower face surface, there are shear stresses in general. And the shear stresses are also adding up to the force in the one direction. So sigma 2, 1 multiplied by the area of the upper surface, which is delta L1, delta L3. Sigma 2, 1 multiplied by the area gives the force which is pointing to the right. Sigma 2, 1 on the lower face multiplied by the area is the force pointing to the left, and that is giving this term here. So we have normal forces. We have forces due to shear stress. And we have the body force, which is pointing in the one direction. So only that component counts here for the one direction. The body force is per volume. So we have to multiply with the whole volume of the cube in order to get the force acting on the cube, the total force acting on the cube. The first line is just taken from the from the previous slide. And you can now take that one and apply the Taylor series. So the Taylor series now is using the argument the function sigma 11a. One, one sigma 11a one, one is now replacing y in my sketch. And the function where do I evaluate it? This is position x1, this is position x2, x1 plus delta, x2. That is the stress in the center of the cube at point p plus delta x times the derivative. Okay, and higher order terms are the higher order terms which I striped out in my sketch. Okay, so we are only using the first term of the Taylor expansion, not the others, and we are allowed to do this if the cube is small enough. This was for the right-hand side, this is for the left-hand side. And when you do this, and when you use insert everything what you have, then you see that the stress difference is delta L1, the length of the cube, horizontal length of the cube, times the first partial derivative with respect to one direction. For the shear stresses, you get the same. Okay, I make a short break here.